All right, so I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna get started now. So uh, welcome everyone, uh, greetings from Philadelphia. My name is Chris Long, I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So happy to spend some time today, hopefully a nice hour with everyone, uh, looking at hypospadias in the pediatric patient. Um, in terms of the structure of this, um, you know, I didn't make this, you know, something where it's a didactic lecture straight from Campbell's. I tried to kind of hit on more concepts within hypospadias and then hopefully, uh, hopefully that makes sense for everyone, so. Make sure this is going okay. All right, so there we go. So what is hypospadia? So a little case vignette here. Um, and so what this is gonna do, this is just gonna kind of introduce just a little bit about staging and hypospadia. So it's an eight month old boy uh, by exam, looks like he has coronal hypospadias. So the meatus down here in terms of where you can see, um, you know, with the pickups here. Um, in terms of any curvature, the parents did not appreciate any curvature at home. And in the office, we didn't appreciate any curvature either. It's a moderate glands groove. And then the glands width is about 10 millimeters. So it's gonna start this off with a pretty exciting question. So how would everyone classify this patient's hypospadias? So mild or distal, moderate mid shaft, severe proximal, or D, you need more information. All right, so good. So basically 80% of people did distal, uh, which is great, um, which would make sense. And then 10% um, did more information. So we'll see, they might actually be onto something here. So, um, <clears throat> so this uh, was the patient, so this is the next step in the patient's case. Uh, and what you see here, this is what the patient looked like with an artificial erection after, um, after degloving. So what you see here, so on this uh, right figure, you see the patient has with the goniometer about 60 to 65 degrees of curvature. So a pretty significant amount of curvature. So now we're gonna go ahead and ask again, how would you classify this patient's hypospadias now? So again, same options, mild, moderate, severe, or you need more information again. All right, so good, now it's a little bit more of a mixed bag. So now you have pretty much everyone from mild, moderate, severe, it's almost uh, even sort of throughout the thing, but the, the one that won was mid shaft or moderate. So, so that's good. And you know, we're not gonna get into too many more details about this case, but like I said, it was just more to introduce you know, what we're sort of looking at when we're classifying hypospadias. Um, this is the obligatory slide anytime we talk about hypospadias, right? Um, so you know, the triad of hypospadias or sort of you know, what you think of whenever you think of hypospadias. So the first is gonna be an ectopic location of the urethra. So there's a little illustration on the right here. So anywhere from in the glands all the way down here to the perineal location. Penile curvature, so the penis is bent forward. So you have some ventral curvature or, or curdi, if you will. Um, incomplete dorsally hooded foreskin. So that's kind of what we're seeing in, in hypospadias. Now, in terms of the severity of hypospadias and how we classify it, so traditionally, you know, the location of the urethral meatus would be sort of that designation. So you see here, we have this red arrow to so get distal penile shaft and anything up distal to that, where you're sort of having that region of, of that red arrow is gonna be what we call a distal hypospadias. Um, now, we get this green arrow here, and that would be, again, that would be the opposite, right? So that would be your proximal hypospadias. Um, but what we've come to learn is it's really not quite so simple. And some of the variants, you know, the majority of, of patients that present, that'll be the case and that'll be fine in using that classification system. But it doesn't really reflect what happens in the operating room and how you're going to have to reconstruct and, and what can happen in terms of complications long term with these patients. And it's really a combination of factors and probably more divided in, ten, in terms of distal versus proximal and not really adding in uh, mid shaft that much anymore. So the glands appearance. Um, another illustration here, just on this far left, you see uh, in this red box, so the urethral meatus, you think this is uh, rocket science for anybody, urethral meatus is supposed to be in the dead center of the glands. You see this green arrow here sort of showing you where the glands fusion is, um, just for the purpose of this illustration. That's why we don't have the foreskin on the front, but obviously otherwise the foreskin would be impacted. Then as you go from left to right, what you're seeing is a progressively more severe sort of form of hypospadias. And, and specifically what I'm getting into with this is, 
sort of the appearance of the glands, you know, in terms of more normal sort of conical like you'd expect in a boy without hypospadias to this flattened sort of amorphous sort of appearance with, you know, no real glue groove um, for, you know, for, for a patient with more severe hypospadias. So what you can imagine if the patient has a deep groove in terms of where the urethral meatus is supposed to be and where that urethra is going to be that you're going to reconstruct, it's a little bit easier to sort of bring that tissue together um, if there's a deeper groove. What you see on the far right, however, where you have the shallow groove, you're going to have to do a little bit more of a reconstruction, particularly if the patient has a smaller glands. It's a little bit more challenging in terms of, you know, rolling the urethra and getting the glands tension-free closure over top of that. And again, the foreskin, you know, basically what you see here, especially on this right panel, uh, the foreskin's incomplete, it's dorsally hooded, it's not covering the ventral aspect of the penis. And, you know, one of the things that is important is that up to 5% of boys with hypospadias will actually have a completely intact foreskin. So they'll come into the office and, you know, they had an attempt at a circumcision after birth, um, and ultimately um, they, had, they were found to have hypospadias once they retract the foreskin. So severity, like I said, instead of just saying, okay, you know, the urethral meatus is going to be associated with that, and we're going to add in the degree of penile curvature. We're going to spend some time uh, in a few minutes going over how we diagnose and sort of manage penile curvature. Uh, associated penile skin anomalies. So penile torsion, penoscrotal webbing, um, penoscrotal transposition. And the reason I put these two pictures in here at the bottom here, so you see on the left side, you see this patient has a decent amount of penoscrotal webbing. Um, and you know, you don't really see the glands of the meatus here, um, but this boy does have hypospadias and the penis is actually a little bit torqued for him as well. And this patient on the right, you see, you know, they're trying to calibrate the urethra and what you see, it's very thin and, and it's almost paper thin down to, you know, where the penoscrotal junction is. You see there's like a flattened glands um, and really just this tissue on the ventral aspect of the penis is pretty abnormal. And, you know, in terms of that classic sort of classification system, you know, you could say, you could argue and say, okay, well, this patient has a distal hypospadias, So, um, you know, that's what they should be categorized as. Um, but, you know, unfortunately or unfortunately, you know, that's, that's not the case. And it really, when you're considering some surgical aspects of things, that's not what it's going to be. And from the standpoint of, you know, other anomalies, hernias, descended testicles, you know, these are probably the most common thing that we encounter with hypospadias. Um, and particularly in boys, you know, that have proximal hypospadias and have even a unilateral and particularly bilateral and descended testes, you know, they need to have a workup at least for uh, a disorder of sexual differentiation. And kind of just, you know, bring this point home again. Um, you know, this is a boy, you sort of look at the backside of the penis and everything looks okay. It looks like the scrotum is relatively okay, a little bit of a bifid scrotum there. Um, but what you see when you look at the lateral aspect, you see that the glands itself is tethered, you know, sort of, you know, going forward there. Um, and on this right side here, you see that there's a proximal location of the meatus. And you see this very clearly that there's a very shallow groove, um, kind of non-conical glands and a really an immature urethral plate there. So um, probably this boy is going to be, I mean, obviously you classify him as a severe variant, um, and probably going to be someone where you're going to have a tough time using that urethral tissue in order to reconstruct the urethra. So surgical considerations in terms of, you know, why we're doing surgery, right? So the goal in this, uh, you know, you kind of hammer home in terms of function. So you want the penis to have a nice straight erection. Um, you want it to have appropriate length. Um, some of the more mild, mild variants, not going to be as much of a concern, but some of these boys with more proximal hypospadias, um, particularly those with concealed penis, uh, it's going to be, you know, the length of the erection is going to be a pretty uh, big factor for them. And then you want to take the urethra and you want to advance it up into the glands or as close to the glands as you can possibly get so that it can allow for safe and appropriate passage of the urine as well as semen when they're an adult. And, you know, from an appearance standpoint, there's no doubt that that does play a role. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about function, but there's, you know, sort of an aesthetic element to it that's important as well. That being said, with these goals in mind, not all patients need surgery. You know, they're going to come in if a boy has a fairly mild variant or if the penis is, is fairly straight and it's not going to sort of cause an issue from a sexual function standpoint, then the parents might elect to sort of defer the operation until they're a little bit older. Uh, maybe they go through toilet training or maybe even when they're teenagers. And it might be something where if they're concerned at that age, then it might be more something where that's where they're to consider repair. It's not something that might, you know, be, you know, not every single boy that comes into the office that we see is going to be recommended surgery. In terms of doing surgery, if after the discussion with the family, it seems like it's warranted, we typically recommend between six and 12 months of age, you know, up to 18 months of age in general, 
Um, but there's a lot of wiggle room with this. Some, you know, we, we do operations and voice uh, of all ages. So it's not, it's not like that's the only sort of window. Um, but if a parent's gonna ask what's the ideal time frame, that's probably your ideal time frame in terms of doing an operation. So an outline of you know, our hypospadias, like the surgery basics. So a real, a real um, sort of pared down sort of version of what we're doing in the operating room. Um, so we got this first box. So this is an anatomic assession, assessment uh, prior to incision. Uh, so the, you know, the initial sort of assessment is obviously in the office. Um, sort of just trying to get a general, general gauge of what's going and what's going to happen in the operating room. If you think it's going to be a one stage repair, two stage repair, etc., just so you can sort of counsel the family appropriately. Then um, you know, you're going to go through and you're going to make your incision and do the penile degloving. Once you do that, that's the time where you're going to go ahead and assess the penile curvature. That boy I showed a couple slides ago where you could see the penis was bent forward. Um, you know, you don't truly know um, to how you know, basically how, how bent that penis is until you really deglove it. And, and that first sort of vignette that we talked about, that's a perfect example of that patient sort of like the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you saw externally and, and there was severe curvature after you degloved the penis. So it's really at that point when you assess it, after you correct the curvature, then that's when you're gonna skip, get to your next sort of branch point. If the curvature is corrected in a fairly straightforward manner, then you're gonna go ahead and, and finish with the single stage repair, urethroplasty, glansplasty, and skin closure. If, it's, if the curvature is a little bit more severe and you have to use a little bit more of a bigger technique, again, which we're gonna get into in a minute, then you might go ahead and proceed with more of a two-stage repair instead of closing everything that day. Again, kind of pretty basic here, but you know, straight penis on the left, uh, curved penis on the far right, um, which again, we'll sort of get into a little more live action shots in a minute here. So in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of the assessing the degree of curvature, right? So, um, you know, in general, the curvature is, is a major determinant of the type of repair. It's not the only determinant, but it does seem to drive a lot of decisions in terms of, you know, what we're going to do in the operating room. And these two examples here sort of give you two ends of the spectrum. On, on the left, you got a boy who penis is degloved. You know, we have a little tourniquet down here at the base of the penis. We got our goniometer in here again. And so what you see is the patient has somewhere between 20 to 30 degrees, um, you know, if that. And, you know, so we consider that fairly mild. Uh, so that should be pretty straightforward in terms of being able to fix that. On the right side, I mean, obviously we can fix this as well, but it's a little bit more severe. And it's, in terms of um, how we fix that, the techniques, like I said, are going to be a little bit more uh, aggressive. So in terms of what causes ventral penile curvature, so first is going to be the skin. And so what can happen is um, for that boy that I showed earlier, in terms of um, when we're calibrating the urethra and you see just how unhealthy that skin is overlying the ventral aspect of the penis, that can significantly shorten the penis. But after you deglove it, if all of a sudden the penis is perfectly straight, then that's great. Um, and if that's the only cause there, then that's, you know, that's on the easier end of things in terms of fixing it. Um, the urethra can be short, just plastic, um, like the boy I showed a couple of images ago, um, where again, it's just not a healthy urethra, just didn't develop properly, and it's just gonna tether the penis until that's released um, and sort of replaced with healthier tissue. And then finally, you get into the intrinsic curvature of the erectile bodies, which we're seeing on both of these patients on the right here, um, particularly that one on the far right, um, where basically the ventral aspect of the tunica on the erectile bodies is, is so dysplastic that it just, it's just short and sort of tethers the penis full. And they're not mutually exclusive. They can all sort of kind of occur in the same patient. Um, and, and so it's not like it's one or the other. And again, the definitive sort of assessment is in the operating room after we degloved. So next one is gonna be sort of, this is just a general algorithm of how we assess and, and treat uh, curvature in the operating room. So again, no residual curvature after degloving, gonna go ahead and fix everything. So mild curvature, a little bit controversial in terms of how we sort of, how you sort of classify mild curvature. Some people would argue 20 degrees, uh, some people would argue up to 45 degrees. Um, we're sort of in the middle, I think we like uh, 30 degrees. Um, ultimately, this is gonna be determined with some studies in terms of recurrence of curvature. But for right now, around 30 degrees is, is our dividing line. Um, if we can get that, then we can proceed with a dorsal application and a single stage repair. Um, there are some instances, particularly when you have a patient that has pretty severely abnormal ventral shaft skin, in which case you want to go ahead and proceed with a two stage repair. But again, that should, shouldn't be the norm. It should hopefully be relatively unusual in terms of having to do that. For patients with moderate to severe curvature, so anything at 30 degrees or above, that's where we're gonna sort of enter into this category of uh, corporal lengthening procedure, 
two-stage repair, although you'll see that there's definitely um, definitely a big group of patients or a big group of surgeons within pediatric urology that would go ahead and proceed with a pretty aggressive dorsal plication and a single stage repair. And in their hands, it does seem to work well for them. So dorsal plication, assuming that probably most of you have already seen and heard of this before, but we'll just kind of go over it briefly. Um, basically on the right here on the top side, what you see is a midline plication. Um, there's a little inset to the illustration here where you see there's like this clear plane in the middle. Um, neurovascular bundle runs at 11 and 1 o'clock on, on patients on the dorsal aspect of the penis. So there's an avascular plane right in the middle there where you can make a cut right in the tunic albuginia um, of an appropriate length opposite the point of maximal curvature. Place your plication suture and basically go ahead and make it so that the penis is nice and straight. Down here on the bottom, um, this is sort of the uh, Zeance modification of the Nesbitt plication where you see the difference between the top one and the bottom one is that you sort of have two parallel incisions on the dorsal aspect of the penis instead of just one right in the middle. Um, and you see they have these basically looks like vessel loops kind of used to mobilize the neurovascular bundles so that you can move them to the side, place your plication sutures underneath, and then kind of um, get a little bit closer to the dorsal midline um, so that you can be away from and spare the neurovascular bundle there. It's in the operating room, just a live shot, so you can get, you know, I don't want to bore everybody with too many illustrations, but basically probably the best sort of view of this is this picture right in the middle here, where you see we've made our incision in the tunica, uh, the, the suture's already in place, and we're just getting ready to tie it down, um, but you sort of get a sense for the length there, probably around like, I don't know, maybe five millimeters in terms of just how long that's going to be, and really as you cinch that down, that's going to go from the penis bent like this to kind of make it nice and straight like that. Um, you see on the bottom there in terms of underlined um, and, and this picture on the far right here basically repeat the artificial erection. You need to make sure it's been corrected and it's not, you know, it's not unheard of that you might sort of place your suture and you might not have corrected it fully or you might have undercorrected it. So it's always best to sort of just check it just to make sure. Um, it's not always like the curvature isn't exactly, you know, at one point in terms of where the bend is. It can be a little bit more of a gradual bend. So if you get Application suture here and application suture here, that's ultimately what might, might uh, sort of allow you to have a straight penis in the end. So I talked about some of the more aggressive techniques. So here we are. <laughs> so this is the ventral lengthening procedure. Um, so basically what you do for these, you're making an incision on the ventral aspect of the penis. So the area where it's shorter um, so that you can release the tension that you have there. And so there's a couple of different approaches to that. So um, you know, when you go ahead and patch that opening. So you see on this illustration here, we have tunica vaginalis, uh, tunica vaginalis flap, graft, or also a dermal graft. Um, so these are just some of the autologous tissues that we can use. Um, but what you see here, and we'll get into a, you know, a picture in a minute, um, you see there's been a cut in the tunica albuginia that basically creates a gap that needs to be filled. Um, and that's the idea behind this approach. Um, you know, you have non-autologous tissue also, this SIS, um, which, you know, you can just get out of the package and go ahead and use to close it. Um, there's also this ventral uh, corporal incisions, multiple, um, these so-called fairy cuts, where basically you make multiple sort of transverse incisions, uh, not completely through, but through a decent amount of the tunic albuginia, not to the point where you're getting down to the erectile tissue, but just enough, then you make enough of them, sometimes people describe up to 50 or 100 little kind of small incisions, um, and ultimately, that's what sort of releases the tension on the front of the penis so that, um, you know, the penis is straight. Then there's also multiple, multiple ventral corporotomies. So same idea in terms of what we're talking about here up top, but instead of making one single large incision, you actually make anywhere from two to three um, incisions and you actually don't cover them. Um, you don't cover them formally with a tunica vaginalis flap or graft, graft excuse me, um, but you kind of cover with dartos or the mobilized urethra and that sort of allows it to sort of close and heal properly. But ultimately they're all sort of addressing the ventral aspect of the penis and making it longer. So here we just have a picture of, a few pictures of running through in the operating room um, of doing a dermal graft. So you see here on the far left panel, uh, at this point, maybe on the next, next slide, but you've already sort of measured the defect in the, corp in, in the corpora that you're going to fill. And then here you basically make this elliptical incision um, all the way down through the dermal layer. Um, the pigmented part, you're gonna sort of just excise, um, so you can get rid of that epidermal layer. Um, and then underneath, um, you're defatting this flap, or sorry, this graft, um, and that's really just leaving you with the, the dermal layer. 
Um, this is what the closure looks like here. We, you know, we take this incision right from the uh, groin crease, and in general, it looks pretty good in terms of uh, scar tissue formation. It's sort of in a natural sort of line, um, so it doesn't cause too much of a problem. Here you see, you know, where that incision has been made uh, into the penis, and you see there's a defect here. For this boy, it's about a centimeter and a half, probably by about, a, about, about one and a half to two centimeters uh, horizontally. Um, these two arrows here in the middle diagram, you see that's the full length of it. So you see the erectile tissue underneath. Um, there's always a little septum in the midline here, which um, usually has to be released. That can sort of tether the penis a little bit afterwards if you don't correct that. And then on the far right, well, sorry, on the lateral incisions, you're making sure that you're not getting close to the neurovascular bundle and just make sure that you're not injuring that area. And usually you don't have to get that close. Um, and here, what you see, so this is a watertight closure. You have, um, you have that graft that's in place. Um, and here we're actually sort of testing the erection again, again, just to sort of confirm that it is uh, fully repaired and the penis is straight. And so usually that does pretty well. So comparing the two, um, so dorsal plication, there's no doubt that that's a quicker procedure. Um, make one little incision and close it. Um, so that's, you know, it's pretty quick in terms of doing the operating room. It allows you to have a single stage repair. So you don't have to, when you have, you can imagine when you have, you know, that free graft on the ventral aspect of the penis, if you try to put a buccal mucosa graft, or if you try to sort of tubulize your urethra over that and it doesn't heal properly, and you get more scar tissue on the ventral aspect of the penis and, and the urethroplasty just is gonna do as well. Um, when everything is directed to the dorsal aspect of the penis, the ventral side is spared and hopefully allows it for a you know, better healing process. Um, in terms of the risk for erectile, defunction, for erectile dysfunction, it should be pretty minimal. Um, but the big thing in terms of you doing this is trying to figure out exactly what degree of curvature is going to allow you to do a dorsal plication so that afterwards, um, you know, as this boy grows and as they heal from the operation, as they're getting erections again, um, is it going to be sustainable long term? You don't want to do a plication in a boy when he's six months old and then when they're 18, their penis is, is bent like this. So uh, patient selection is definitely key in terms of using uh, plication. Ventral lengthening, so again, I mentioned this is more effective for more severe curvature, um, does result in a longer penis. So these boys are doing it for the ones that have um, uh, proximal hypospadias. You know, their penis is, is shorter to begin with. And then when that ventral aspect is shorter, if you can add a centimeter and a half to two centimeters, uh, it's gonna have a pretty big impact for them, especially as they get older. Um, what we don't know, or you know, a theoretical risk of this is the risk for erectile dysfunction. Um, you look at some of the data in patients with Peyronie's and the adult literature, um, I think it's, it's definitely different um, in terms of the patient sort of selection and the patient process. Um, but, you know, it's definitely something that, you know, we're, we're following and, and trying to figure out for our patients as they get older. So I was going to run through a couple of sort of considerations for the operating room. I, again, tried to not, not sort of bombard you with too many things, but just kind of a couple of sort of points that are sort of relevant to um, our operation. But... Um, so perioperative antibiotics, and this runs the whole gamut from people not giving any antibiotics whatsoever uh, to some people giving antibiotics uh, when the patient goes to sleep and then prophylaxis until the stents come out. Um, nothing's really been proven in terms of, um, um, you know, much of a benefit other than, um, you know, the risk of UTI is fairly low. Um, so we're, you know, some of the studies going to see just how great that is um, in terms of the benefits. Anesthesia, obviously everybody's gonna get anesthesia for the operation. Um, you know, general anesthesia is, is, is the norm for most patients. Um, some groups are doing this under spinal anesthesia, so that's a nice benefit, particularly for the younger patients. Um, the use of caudal anesthesia, it, you know, we try to do a lot of blocks just to sort of make it so that, um, you know, patients are comfortable in the operating room and after. Um, there's some reports that sort of, conflicting reports basically, in terms of the risk of doing caudal blocks and, and you know, some penile, um, uh, engorgement and whether that leads to fistulas afterwards. Um, the current theory is, is probably not right now, but it is something that's uh, been debated back and forth for a while. Um, pedendal nerve blocks are a nice option um, and they're kind of using that more and more uh, from our standpoint. Uh, surgical volume, uh, there's no doubt that this plays a role. I mean, the higher volume has been associated with a lower complication rate. Sort of makes sense. <clears throat> Uh, gentle tissue handling, decreased wound tension, these are probably the two biggest factors that are going to you know, help in terms of, um, you know, healing afterwards. I have a picture in the bottom right there of your screen that shows a microscope. So <clears throat> a chop, um, you know, quite a few of us are, are used the microscope in terms of doing our hypospadias repairs, um, really just magnifies the tissue and really just allows for real minimizing the tissue handling and real precise suture placement, um, just really just gives you a great view of the operation. 
multiple layers of vascularized tissue, you know, or some element of ischemia for some of this tissue after you cut it and when you're going through the operation, um, there's no doubt that sort of these barrier layers and sort of increasing the amount of well vascularized tissue into that area is going to help the healing process. Hemostasis, again, we got some pictures up here on the right. On the top right of all kinds of different dressings, um, if you look in Campbell's, there's another probably four or five different ones you can put on there. Some will get pretty crazy because it's like a mummy. Um, but in general, um, fairly simple compression dressing um, that really just kind of allows you to maintain hemostasis is going to be a big thing in terms of um, decreasing your wound tension and allowing your uh, repair to, to heal properly. Testosterone is another sort of controversial topic right up there with caudal blocks. Um, you know, the idea behind it is you give some preoperative testosterone, makes the, the glands of the penis bigger, um, and that sort of, as you sort of close the glands and close the urethra, sort of takes some of the tension off the repair as you do it. Um, some, some sides are completely against it, some sides are, some sides are completely for it. So it just depends on which side of the, of the fence you sit on. All right, so I think it's been a while now, so we'll go ahead and ask another question here. So there is one single repair that should be utilized for distal hypospadias. Twenty seconds seems like a long time for this, but <laughs> or it sounded short, but it seems like it's long. So, so great. So, I, eight, ninety percent of people said uh, false. So that's great. So that is definitely true. I mean, sorry, that is definitely false. Um, so I was going to go through. So there have been, um, you know, a, a, the general sort of thought is that there's well over three hundred sort of described sort of variations of doing a hypospadias repair. Um, I'm going to get into about three distal repairs, just kind of like some general sort of guidelines, um, probably the most used repairs. Um, and, you know, it's just beyond the scope of, of this uh, talk. But so the one, I was going to start with the one that we use the most, the CHOP. So this is a tears to play repair, um, developed over 140 years ago. It's been around for a long time. And basically what you see, and you can see in this illustration, is you know, you're, you're creating a U-shaped incision on the ventral aspect of the penis um, around where the urethra is going to be, and that's what you're going to close. Um, you see this illustration on the right here where they're sort of suturing this area closed. Um, and so I actually have some videos. I'm not going to explain this too much because I have a couple of videos here. So I'm going to see if we can go through this. I hope this comes through okay. Um, so far left here, um, so this is... I'm a patient, what you see here <clears throat> is you have the pickup within the, within the meatus, so subcoronal meatus. Um, and so what we're incising here, there's a little cleft that's sort of making the urethral meatus a little bit smaller uh, than you'd expect it to be. So you just kind of gently incise, incise the skin there just to kind of make sure that that's kind of flattened out. And that cleft is pretty common in boys that have hypospadias. Then on the right here, what you're seeing is we're, we're marking our U incision. So the atus is down here at the bottom. You see there's a holding suture here up the top and the U incision is marked. On the medial aspect of that, that's basically that U, that inside of that U is what you're gonna roll into the urethra. Now the outside part of that, the lateral aspect of that on the glands and a little bit lower here is what you're gonna use for your glands plasty and to bring everything together. So now on the left side here, what you see is there's a stent in the urethra. You see, we've gone through, we made our incision, so our U is sort of, for our urethra, is sort of an island, right? So that's kind of on its own, or I guess it's peninsula. Um, and then you see that the glands, the sort of glands wings on the side have been mobilized so that you can bring that over your urethroplasty. Um, and you have this set up for yourself. Now on the right panel here, what you're seeing is at the bottom here, at the six o'clock position, you know, we're gonna basically, it's a seven ovicral. What you're doing is we're going to go ahead and close this from the bottom up. We're going to zip it all the way from the bottom all the way up to where you expect the urethra meatus to be. So now this next slide, what you're seeing is we're going through the closure here. You see a nice subepithelial closure. This is kind of coming together. You see there's nice robust tissue in terms of bringing that together. So a real nice repair in terms of getting that together and having everything approximated well. Now you see here the, the video paused and what you're seeing is sort of right here at the top of where your sort of major glands incisions, that's where you're gonna stop the meatus, um, your neomeatus. And it's not, it's one of those uh, sort of Goldilocks situation and you can sort of make it where that meatus is too small, you get stenosis and that's gonna sort of lead to failure of your repair. So on the right side, what you're seeing is uh, we're basically, so you, 
you ran the closure up um, to the, the, the distal most aspect, and now what you're doing it is you're running it back down to the bottom now. And so um, if you're doing this in a continuous fashion, you're not leaving a uh, suture up here, you're not tying a knot up here, um, so you're just kind of running it back down to the base here just to kind of close everything. And really with that, you're getting a watertight two-layer closure. You know, if you didn't get it perfect the first time, that second layer where you're sort of imbricating everything should make it so that it's nice and tightly closed. So now, now we get to uh, the barrier layer. So I mentioned that a couple times already. So we're gonna get to there's another example on another slide here later. But what you're seeing here is this is actually a dorsally based dartose flap. And so what you're doing is that redundant prepuce that you're not gonna need to sort of use to reconstruct the urethra here, you de-epithelialize that, you take that nice supple dartos, which you sort of see here, uh, you harvest that and then you literally suture it, secure it across um, your urethroplasty, keeping your suture line lateral, so you're avoiding overlying suture lines. Um, so that again, just sort of giving you a nice vascular bed to sort of keep those, that area where you suture everything um, well perfused. Then on the right side here, um, don't want to belabor the point, but basically what we're doing here is you're going ahead and you're placed some uh, subepithelial sutures. You're just basically bringing the spongiosum of the glands together. You have um, that hemostat there. You're sort of protecting that. You want to make sure your stitches aren't violating your barrier layer, aren't violating the urethra, um, and just making sure that there's not too much tension when you're bringing that glands together. So it's a little bit of a protection there. So um, let's get on to the next slide here. And then now finally, basically just kind of finalizing the reapproximation of the glands here. You see underneath, so this is the coronal margin right there, uh, right where my, hopefully you guys can see my mouse. Um, and then underneath you have the mucosal collar here. So uh, the mucosal collar is always sort of absent, almost like a V in the front here. So you kind of bring those flaps together so that they reapproximate all the way around. And it's there circumferentially like you'd expect in a circumcised penis. That's the end of the videos for now. So, uh, so I was gonna talk about two more repairs. And um, so this is the tip, the tubular eyes and size plate. Um, some people call it the Snodgrass repair. So, you know, this is probably the most common repair used across the world, really. Um, and it's, it's definitely a variation of the theme in terms of the tears to play. And so what you notice, if you sort of compare this to the previous illustration, is that you, you're making your parallel lines the same way that you did before, but you notice there's less of a U, so there's less of a wide U. You're sort of coming pretty close on the urethral plate there. And where you're sort of getting your increase in your length, where you're allowing that to get closed, is by making an incision in the midline of the glands here, right at that 12 o'clock position. And by incising that area, and you, you basically leave it open, when you incise that, you're basically raising little flaps that you can, that, of, of your urethral plate, that you can roll together and do your urethroplasty, like you did for the tears to play repair. Again, I mentioned there's a bunch of different variants. The most common variant for this is something called a, an inlay graft, so a dorsal inlay graft, where you cut here in the middle, you take a little piece of interprepucial skin, and you secure that in the middle where you've made your incision so that you give yourself a nice wide plate, sort of like you have in the tears to play, and then you roll that together. And the remainder of the operation is the same in terms of the glands closure, barrier layers, etc. So this is an island onlay flap. Um, so this is a little bit different in terms of the theory behind this. So what you see here um, on this illustration on the right is that you have um, a schematic where you're actually harvesting, you have a rectangle in the interprofusial skin here, and then you have um, on the penis itself, on the ventral aspect, sort of a parallel incision similar to what you have for the tip repair. And so where we like to use this is for a patient that might have a mid-shaft type of or you have a really narrow strip of the urethral plate. Um, in which case you need to make, you know, that plate isn't good enough to even do a tip or a tears to play. There's just not enough tissue there to use that and, and get a nice closure. So what you see is we harvest, um, so we harvest some inner prepuce and you get a nice little rectangle that you're going to use that flap to augment what you have in terms of the urethral plate. So in C here, what you have is um, C, you have here where you're mobilizing, where you're, where you're securing that flap in place on the lateral aspect of the urethral plate. Then in D, you see after you get that one side secured and sutured together, now you're running up and sort of zipping it closed on the contralateral side. Um, and you see that reflected in E. And so once that's all done, what you've done is you've taken that epithelial layer and you keep that on the inside of the urethra and you've augmented it so that you have enough urethra to sort of close it, make a nice equal caliber tube, then again, the right remainder of the 
excuse me, operation is the same in terms of where you're closing the glands um, and closing the penile shaft span. So proximal hypospadia. So I think I have like three slides on this. You could probably do a couple hours on this, to be honest with you. So it's not going to do it any justice. But um, I think at least for this talk, I think, you know, we'll kind of touch on a, a base, couple of basic topics. Um, so this patient's sort of uh, coming back again here, just kind of recycle program. But uh, so what you see is, again, you've got this patient with the penis scrotal webbing. And you see this patient has uh, really this immature urethral tissue very thin hypoplastic skin overlying the urethra all the way down to the penis scrotal junction. Um, and so these patients, you really need to transfer healthy skin to the ventral aspect of the penis. You got to correct the curvature and all these are important elements in terms of pursuing a, a two-stage repair. So two-stage repair, the first stage, uh, you know, the general idea behind this is you're going to correct the curvature and then you're going to rearrange the skin for the second stage. And the second stage is when you go through and do the, the other stuff. So Urethroplasty, glansplasty, and closure of the penile shaft skin. Um, so we've got lots of these fun little illustrations. So we've got a couple more here. And so what you see here, so, <clears throat> so you're making your incision. And so the, the, the difference between this and some of the other, other sort of um, schematics is that you're making an incision down here right in the midline of the aspect of the penis. Um, and really the, be, the reason being is that the urethral plate is immature and you're not going to be able to use it. So you, you can incise in that area. Um, and panel B here, what you're seeing is you're excising, you know, sort of the cordy tissue or the tissue that's sort of tethering the penis forward. Um, C, you know, this is an artificial erection after the curvature has already been corrected. And we've already sort of, you know, went through that. I'm not going to go through that here, but, you know, for our standpoint, we've already done a dermal graft or tunica vaginalis graft, and, and that's corrected. So then what you're doing, I'm sure people have heard of this buyer's flap, but what you see down here in E is you take the redundant interprepucial skin that's on the dorsal aspect of the penis, cut it down the midline at the 12 o'clock position, and then what you're doing in F, and what you see in F is that you've, you've taken those two um, sort of sheets of skin, those flaps of skin, and then you rotate them ventrally, secure them in the midline so that ultimately that's gonna be your urethra at the second stage. And so that's what you're seeing here on this one. So, um, you know, again, it's all sort of a variation of the theme. You see in G, that looks like a big Pierce Duple, right? So, so basically you're making a big U incision, you close that in two layers, then you bring over a barrier layer, um, then you go ahead and close the, you know, the glands and the, um, and the shaft skin. So I put this in here in terms of the barrier layer. You see in a minute, the complication rate for um, proximal hypospadias is definitely higher than it is for distal hypospadias. Um, and one of the things that we can sort of tip those odds in our favor is to go ahead and use a barrier layer. So you see here, uh, tunica vaginalis is probably the best thing to use. Um, you can also use uh, some dartos, um, which is a nice option as well. But if you can, probably the, the best thing you can use is some tunica vaginalis. And what you see here on the left side of this panel, so this is the spermatic cord right here, and this is the testicle coming down this way. And what you see, there's a pickup way up here at sort of that 12 o'clock position. And what you have is that tunica vaginalis. And what you see here is that's been draped across the repair from all the way down here, uh, all the way up to the top. So um, just really there just to kind of um, secure everything in place. So distal hypospadias repair, you know, in terms of what's out there in the literature, anywhere from complication rate from five to even 20, maybe sometimes even 30%. Um, in general, if you're, you know, the bigger series basically show up somewhere, somewhere around like 10% is probably average in terms of across the country and probably across the world. Proximal hypospadias, like I said, is a lot higher. Um, you know, the lowest report out there are probably around 20, 25%, um, and the highest probably in the 70s in terms of, you know, the complication rate. And, and you know, we've, we've looked at our, looks like there's a course in here. Um, so I'm gonna answer a question here. So it looks like, uh, so somebody asked, uh, what is the actual neo-urethral plate and when do we use the term? So let me see if I can go back. Let's see if I can go back here um, with a few slides. So, so I think in terms of, so there's also a lot of, um, sorry, trying to figure out exactly where I could sort of answer this question for you. So, so in terms of the urethral plate, so, th so the urethral plate is a little bit controversial in terms of how people feel about it. I mean, everybody kind of defines it differently. So if you, so your urethral plate is, is what is functionally your urethra. So if you're doing a tip, then basically where you sort of draw your lines on the outside here, which is usually sort of the inner lining of the glands, that is gonna be your urethral plate. 
Now, if you're doing a tissue to play and you're going a little bit wider there, you might even incorporate a little bit of glands tissue. Um, you know, so it's sort of where you sort of define your urethral plate. Um, but, you know, if you ask 10 different pediatric urologists, you'll probably get 10 different answers on that in terms of exactly what it is. Um, and the reason why some people choose the tip versus the tears to play versus an on onlay is because how they define the urethral plate is a little bit different for everyone. Um, so, um, so it just depends, I guess. I mean, I think it depends from a technical standpoint how you're doing it. Um, you know, if you're going to say a neo-urethral plate or you completely, you know, reconstruct it, then again, when you have this two-stage repair, um, you know, this urethral plate is te technically, um, you know, interprepucial skin that you sort of transferred over here on that first stage repair. So, so like I said, I think it's, it's varies by patient. Um, and it also has to do with, uh, sort of mentioned that sort of deep urethral groove earlier in the, in the talk. Um, if you have a deep urethral groove, you might have more robust urethral plate. Um, and again, for those shallow grooves, it sort of blurs the line a little bit in terms of where the urethral plate, as you would think of it in a normal urethra, um, versus something that you're going to have to reconstruct. So um, I hope that answers your question. If not, please, uh, you know, feel free to feel free to ask a follow-up. So uh, again, we sort of went through this. So proximal hypospadias uh, has a higher complication rate. Um, and higher complications with, uh, with longer follow-up, but we just published our sort of look at this with over a thousand patients and, you know, only 50% of complications are noted within the first year of surgery. So it's a significant number that are occurring after that. So, so complications, uh, this is what we all love and it's kind of the, the bane of our existence. Um, but, you know, these do happen after hypospadias. And so uh, your research continuous fistula. Um, so you see here, so on the left side, you can see the meatus is up here in the glands. And then you see there's these two black arrows here that are pointing to, you know, it looks like there's a hole in the skin right here and there's a hole in the skin right there. Fairly obvious here on the right one, right? So in B, there's a big lacrimal duct probe that's going through that. And so this is interesting because, you know, what you see here is you have the meatus right there, then you have sort of this little bridge of tissue, and then you have the bottom aspect of this fistula right here. And so what probably happened is that really there's almost like a little band of scar tissue here at where the glands was fused. And ultimately the urethra just didn't close here and opened up and that's what sort of led to the fistula. So um, in terms of doing this repair for the fistula, in the next slide you'll be able to see, but uh, for this one, you actually would just, you know, cut through that band and, and redo the, the fistula, you know, just kind of redo a glands class and close that. Um, let's see, so urethral diverticulum. Um, hopefully you all can see that. If not, there's a little arrow there just to kind of show you. So you see that's the saculation of the urethra, um, some laxity to that area. So you're kind of getting some turbulent urine flow. Um, how that could present, you know, that can be a patient has a little bit of dribbling after they're urinating. Um, definitely associated probably more with a two-stage hyperspace repair when you use a flap than anything else. But, you know, we've seen it, we've encountered it in, in patients that have undergone any type of repair. And glands dehiscence were basically, you know, obviously the glands you sort of want to fuse up to this point, but you see the meatus is at a subcoronal location and the glands isn't approximated there. So urethral cutaneous fistula repair. So what you see here, so this patient in the operating room, um, you see that there is a fistula opening here down at the mucosal collar. Um, obviously that's not supposed to be there. This is, you know, you sort of have, you have some stitches here, some holding sutures that are keeping that open. Um, and so this is the schematic in terms of how we're going to fix that. So basically you have uh, sort of like a diamond shape sort of it's, uh, marking sort of around the area where the fistula is. And then you have an extension here into the skin, right? So um, ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to use that extra area. You don't want to just excise, you know, where the fistula is and close it, but use that extra area right there, a little bit extra dark to it. So you sort of wrap over again, sort of some barrier layers going to help you close that. So what you see here is um, the incision around the fistula tract that's been isolated and you have down here a little bit of um, that dartos tissue that you're going to swing over. And again, you sort of a little bit more uh, better harvest over here, kind of which going to drape across once you close this. So just like we do when we close, um, you know, when we close the urethra, you get a running two layer closure here just to make sure you get all those epithelial edges together and then also sort of implicate it in. Then if you can get another two layers of dartos uh, flaps coming from one side versus the other, or um, you know, anterior and posterior, just to kind of rotate over top. And then ultimately you kind of close that in the midline. And, and again, this is sort of away from the glands, uh, probably a little bit easier to fix in terms of repairing that um, fistula. 
Now back to that urethral.reticulum. So we have a couple of nice pictures here. So I figured I'd put that in just to kind of show you how to repair that. So the penis has been degloved here. Basically make a ventral incision right over this. And you see here, this is where that big saculation is of the urethra. You do note that this tissue is actually quite, um, quite nice and supple. So now what you did was you incised vertically um, into the diverticulum. And you see what you've got, you've got all this extra tissue here off to the side um, on either side of here. Again, I hope everybody can see my mouse. Um, and you see sort of these purple markings and what we're narrowed down to on the bottom left panel. And that's ultimately what's gonna be your, your urethra that you wanna close. So you sort of measure that, you mark it, say, okay, this is the caliber of the urethra that we want there. And anything lateral to that is excess and we don't need it. Um, but instead of just getting rid of that tissue, you actually de-epithelialize it again for, for the barrier layer that you're going to bring over top. So what you see here in this bot middle, on the bottom row in the middle panel, what you see is the urethra has been closed. So you can see some suture lines in the middle there. And then either pickup is basically holding, you know, these nice sort of dartos flaps that you're going to basically crisscross like a flap jacket over top just to give you some extra coverage. All right, I think this is the last question we got. So. Um, when can we reassure the family that their son's hyperspadius repair was successful and that he is no longer at risk for developing a complication? Six months after the repair, one year after they're toilet trained, seems like a good time in terms of when they're urinating, once they enter puberty, once they're an adult, or none of the above. All right, none of the above, I like it. So that's good. I think everybody's kind of in tune with what we're talking about here. So um, kind of advance this a little bit more. So let's get to, so <clears throat> lack of quality follow-up is something that's a pretty bad problem in the urology literature. Um, and, you know, we were guilty of it to a chop. Uh, basically, you sort of get to the point six to 12 months after surgery and you'd said, okay, we're good. You know, you don't need to see you anymore. Call us if there's a problem. What we found is that patients weren't calling us. And um, you know, we're sort of suffering with issues that, you know, could have been addressed if we saw that. So, so now this is a general scheme of when we see patients, six to 12 months after surgery, you know, toilet training, so we can assess what the urethra looks like, or sorry, what the, how the urethra is functioning when they're urinating, prior to puberty, you know, when they enter into adulthood. Again, so what you're trying to assess is what they're doing as the penis is growing through puberty. And as they start using things sexually, is everything holding up like we expected to after we repaired it when they were an infant? Try to get some quality follow-up in terms of a Euroflow or the video of the kids voiding. Um, standardized assessment, like uh, gathering pictures so that, you know, is there gonna be a way in the future where we can sort of do some independent review? You know, if one of the other surgeons looks at a patient and sort of sees something differently than I will, it's gonna be a little bit of bias from my end that everything looks right, right? Um, and then patient reported outcomes. So all of these things, I mean, I think what the literature sort of shows us is that, you know, hypospadias needs to be identified not as a condition of infancy, but instead of a lifelong issue that requires long-term assessment by the surgeon, um, as these boys and as their penis develops into adulthood, um, you know, there's definitely some changes that occur as they go through that pubertal growth. And so the major questions that, you know, we're trying to look at now in terms of following our patients long-term is, what happens to these repairs of these boys grow? Will the reconstructed tissue have the same growth potential as the remainder of the penile shaft tissue? Um, how happy are the patients? Is the surgeon assessment, is that gonna be equal to the patient assessment? Their sexual function, their urinary function, when can we assess it? We certainly can't assess it in, in a six month old or you know, a one year old. Um, so, so these things really, these patients really need to be followed long term. And you know, one of the big things that's come out, there's, you know, there's a few studies recently that adolescents are particularly high risk for poor body image and concerned about their diagnosis and the appearance of the penis. And these boys that develop you know, poor body image are going to be, you know, associated with poor outcomes in adulthood. Um, they're going to be so concerned about it, maybe less likely to be happy and, um, you know, less, li less, less happy in life. Um, earlier age of surgery is definitely associated with a better psychological outcome. Um, in terms of sexual function, there's a similar, a similar onset of the age in terms of when these boys get sexual contact. Although in general, men are a little bit less sexually active after they've had a hyperspadius repair. Um, sexually satisfied, excuse me. They are equally active. Um, although all these outcome measures are slightly worse in patients with proximal hypospadias, and particularly they have, you know, associated with a, a shorter penile length um, and less growth in order to puberty. So I think we're coming to the end here, but I just want to mention that these patient reported outcomes, you know, there's five standardized questionnaires that are out there. 
the HODE is the HOPE, um, PPS, the uh, you know, penile perception score, the pediatric, pediatric penile perception score, and the general perception score. So a lot of these, you know, and they're great. I mean, I think that, you know, they're really trying to advance the bar in terms of making a standardized assessment of how things are going after hypospadias. But a lot of them are really focused on the cosmetic outcome. And, and really what you're lacking is that urinary function assessment, sexual function assessment, and the psychological element. And, and these are all going to be parts that are um, all aspects of hypospadias that, that are going to need to be um, studied further. And I can't finish this talk without talking about Dr. Duckett. So Dr. Duckett, um, you know, kind of founded the program of, of pediatric neurology at CHOP um, and is really a pillar in terms of hypospadias. And back in 1995, he published this paper sort of looking at hypospadiology and coined that term that, that holds a lot of relevance today and a lot of what we do. Um, and he said it for the study of boys with hypospadias and the outcomes that we witness. And he called hypospadias surgery, you know, a difficult science that is humbling and energy consuming. You know, if you have the complication rate that's 50, 60, 70%, it's something that from a surgical standpoint, we got to get better. And, and that's what we're working on now. I also got to mention these two guys. So Dr. Uh, Canning and Dr. Zayans, two of my mentors at CHOP and, um, you know, kind of helped me along a lot in my training, but, um, you know, it's nice to be able to call these guys my partners and, and really kind of advance everything from a hypospadias standpoint. And, um, and, great so um, I want to thank everyone for participating and um, hopefully that kind of covered at least some aspects of hypospadias I could have talked about this probably for five or six more hours I probably wouldn't have had anybody, anybody in the audience but we thank you for your participation and uh, open this up to any questions if anybody has any. All right, well, if there's no questions, I'll leave it at that.